year ago uh, was I think Winnie the Pooh as a as a character as a concept that used to be owned by somebody who created it and at some point that person had been had passed away for a while and therefore Winnie the Pooh was created was placed in the public domain that means if you have something related to Winnie the Pooh and you want to share it you're allowed to without attributing the actual creator of Winnie the Pooh you're also allowed to edit that concept or the the pictures or the name or whatever that's what the second column means so if you copy it if you distribute it it doesn't have to be identical to the original re you received you're allowed to create derivative works because the creative work you're talking about let's say a book by Frank Kafka for example Franz Kafka uh, that book is no longer protected by IP law it, uh, is, it belongs to everybody so you're allowed to change it however way however you want you're also allowed to sell it if you want I mean, it's already everybody's property, but you are allowed to sell it if you want. And you can, if you um, create a derivative work, so for example, you have a book of Franz Kafka and you change the beetle to a butterfly, for example, uh, you're allowed to do this. And then the new book that you release, you don't have to place any specific license on it. You can license it however you want. So in the public domain, you can basically do whatever you want. And that's how everything used to work until we got IP law. Then we got IP law and they basically changed everything around IP law says anything that you create is yours you own the copyright so nobody else is allowed to do anything with it they're not allowed to copy it or distribute it without your permission there whether they are allowed to change it doesn't apply because they're not allowed to copy it anyway they're definitely not allowed to sell it um, and the kind of license they place on derived products doesn't matter because they're not allowed to create any derived products basically you are the only person who determines what happens with it this is the license that rests by default on everything you create. If you now create a questionnaire, it's copyrighted. If you create a letter that you send to your ethical committee, it's copyrighted, et cetera, et cetera. Any creative work you create basically is copyrighted. And there are some exceptions. Some things are correspondence, some things are exceptional, but are like under certain conditions, things are not copyrighted basically, but the default, the best assumption is to assume that something is copyrighted and other people are not allowed to use it. From an open science perspective, of course, that's not so useful. Ideally, we want people to be able to reuse stuff. And then it's useful to think about the kind of conditions you want to place upon this. And that's what you can determine with licenses. And then we get to the set of licenses that's after copyright probably the best known. And those are the CC licenses or the Creative Commons licenses. And the simplest one that's usually placed on open access articles is CC BY. And the BY stands for attribution. So that means that if you have something that's licensed with CC BY, you are allowed to distribute it and copy it. You can give it to anybody. You can make as many copies if you, if you, as you want. But when you use it, you always have to attribute the original creator. Basically, citation, what we do in research. Um, you're also allowed to create derivative works. So you can take the product and change it a bit. You're never allowed to do such in a way that you imply that the original creator agrees with what you did, but you can do it. For example, you can use stuff in systematic reviews, to give an example. Um, you are allowed to sell it if you want. I mean, that would be unsensible because like open access articles are already free. So why would you want to sell them? But you are allowed to sell them. So if you want to become really rich, then just go to an open access journal, print all the articles, go to a marketplace and try to sell them. Um, and if you change some stuff and you license it again, you can use whichever license you want. Then you have the buy and e license. That means that you're not allowed to create derivatives. So you're not actually allowed to change it. You're only allowed to pass it on exactly as you got it. You're still allowed to sell it, but you can't add any nice pictures, for example. So of course, nobody wants this. Because you can't change it and you can't re-release it, there's also no um, mandate regarding which license you would use if you would change it. Because, of course, you can't change it anyway. So you're only allowed to pass on the product, the creative work, exactly as you got it. So that means that the license also stays the same. Then you have buy and see. That still means you need to attribute people, but people are not allowed to use it for any commercial purposes. So it can't be sold. This, of course, is quite attractive if you're in the academic uh, sector. For example, if you create a questionnaire, you can license it under buy and see. That means that people can uh, share it, people can adapt it, people can change it, but nobody is allowed to use it for commercial purposes. 
that doesn't mean that it can't be used for commercial purposes. Because you uh, attach the license. So if somebody comes to you and they say, oh, I have a great idea. I'm going to go to this big meeting of people and I want to sell your questionnaire to them for five euro a piece. Then you can actually allow them to do this because you are the owner of the intellectual property of this questionnaire. So these licenses just tell people what they're allowed to do without any special licensing from you. But you're always allowed to give people more rights as a license holder. But this way, by default, nobody is allowed to sell uh, a questionnaire or stimulus or whatever. Um, then um, there's also share alike that forces people to apply the same license. So that means in this case that the if you um, have a questionnaire and you license it under the by SA, by share alike uh, license, that means other people are allowed to, to change it. But if they change it, the changed questionnaire also has to have this share alike uh, license attached. So it's kind of like a pay it forward model. It kind of um, promotes that people share stuff. They're not allowed to use a more restrictive license, which they are allowed with other uh, licensing models. So they can, for example, take your questionnaire, adjust it, and then license it with a model that says this change version cannot be used by anybody. And if you want to prevent this from happening, then you can use the share alike principle. Then you can combine this with the non-commercial module as well. So if you license something like this, like so this is like hyper idealistic kind of, uh, then people have to um, cite you. Um, they're not allowed to use it for anything commercial and they are allowed to change it. But if they then re-release it, it has to have a similarly like permissive kind of license. So they're not allowed to close it off afterwards. And then finally, you can also say, okay, I want all that, but they're not actually not allowed to change it. I want my questionnaire to stay exactly as it is. And then you use by and C and D. So these are the kind of uh, flavors that you have if you want to license a creative work. There's of course, there are many more flavors because you can create any license you want, but these are all valid. They're created by a not-for-profit that makes sure that they actually are like legally binding, that they work in all legislations. So if you attach one of these, it's fine. If you're allowed to attach one of these, of course, because if I find um, a copy of this, I don't even know where it's, oh, the transformation, I think it's called, right? This book by Franz Kafka, that's now in the public domain. If I find a copy of this book and I try to license it under one of these licenses, that's void because I don't own the book because it exists in the public domain. Facts also exist in the public domain. So if I um, take, for example, the fact that it's really hot, oh, that's uh, excellent. Shall I pretend like I'm not home or shall I just quickly? Oh, I'll just quickly. One second. I'm sorry. I'll be back in a second. Wasn't even anything exciting. It was just meal for the neighbors. Um, okay, so these uh, licenses you can slap onto anything that's a creative work if you own it, and then this determines what people can do to it, to, to it or with it, without any further communication with you. And you're also always allowed to give them extra rights if you want to. Okay, um, then software, as I said, is a bit special um, because software is very commonly reused. So that means the licenses are also um, geared towards potentially reusing a little bit of software in other software. And as I said, it's a bit more complicated, but basically there are two sets of licenses to consider. Nicely discussed in this uh, PLOS Biology, PLOS One Biology article, I think. Um, because software is so often reused, you really have to think about what happens if somebody wants to use your software in their software. So if you have a bit of analysis script and you want to license it and you want to uh, make sure that other people uh, also share their analysis script if they reuse yours, for example, or you want to make sure that they're allowed to sell their analysis script if they reuse yours, then you have to choose the license here quite carefully. So proprietary licenses, that's just copyright basically. So that means nobody's allowed to do anything with it. So that's the kind of software that we try to phase out in open science because we want to go for open infrastructure. 
So that means uh, no zoom, for example, but instead meet, Jitsi, Jitsi meet. No Qualtrics, but Lime Survey, no SPSS, but Jamovi and R, stuff like that. So no proprietary licenses and only open licenses. Then on the other side, you have the permissive licenses. And that basically means anybody is allowed to do anything. And that also means that if you reuse software with a permissive license, like the BSD license or the MIT license, you are then allowed to actually sell that product and attach a proprietary license to it. Not, of course, to the bits of code that were already licensed with a permissive license, but to the whole product. So if you invent a brilliant analysis and you write it in R or in SPSS script, and you license it under a permissive license, under the MIT license, for example, then somebody else is allowed to take this, use it in their program, and then sell that program under a proprietary license so that nobody is allowed to use that again. If you want to prevent this, you can use one of the copyleft licenses like GPL or LGPL. Those licenses mean that if this software is used in another product, it has to be licensed, stim licensed similarly openly. So then if you write your code for a brilliant analysis and somebody uses this in their program, then they're not allowed to sell the program anymore. They have to, or at least they have to use a copyleft license. They might be allowed to sell it, but they're not allowed to license it with a proprietary license. Okay, so this is only relevant if you are thinking about how to license analysis source code. So a nice default is GPL, which is often used for open source software as well. And then finally, we have data, which you can also kind of license. So you have qualitative data and quantitative data. Um, quantitative data is the easiest. There are two types of quantitative data. There's personal data, which is about an identifiable individual that's always owned by that person. It can never be owned by a researcher. It can never be owned by an organization. It's always owned by that person. That's why the GDPR very clearly stipulates that you are only allowed to process it for a temporary period as an organization and under certain conditions. So you have to indicate which kind of data processing you're planning, who has access to the data, how you make sure it doesn't leak, nobody else gets to it, stuff like that. Because you are only temporarily taking care of the data for the person who actually owns it, the person who it's about. Obviously, you're not allowed to share this personal data. The other type of data are facts. Facts are all the data that are not personal data. So if you have a, a series of questionnaires and you give it to pe people and the resulting data set doesn't contain any lines that can be uh, attached to any specific person, that can be derived to any specific person, so none of the data is personal data, then the data set consists only of facts and facts are defined as existing in the public domain. So that means they can't be owned by the person who provided them or by you or by your organization or by anybody else. So that's simple. If you have anonymous data, it just can't be owned. That also means that IP law doesn't apply or well, it applies to the degree that it probably says that facts are in the public domain. But after that, you can't license it. You can't say you own it, you can't copyright it. There's an exception, I'll get to that later, but in principle, data that are not about a person can just be freely shared and they, nobody can make any claims to it. For qualitative data, it's a bit more complicated because arguably, if you are interviewed, the transcript that results, for example, is actually a creative work. It's what you said. It might be, you know, you might even recite a poem that you created to make it very clear, but in principle, you could even say, you know, the interviewer and the interviewee write a story together. There is a narrative. And this, this, is, a, this is a creative work of the interviewee, arguably. The easiest way to deal with this is to make sure in the informed consent that people consent to placing this in the public domain. Because, of course, to the degree that it's a creative work, they decide what happens with it and they can decide to license it in the public domain. That means that it's no longer owned by anybody. They basically void all their rights, which means that it then becomes reusable for research and it can be shared. Uh, together with uh, James Green and Sylvia Zerger, both also coming to the HPS now and then, uh, we created this open consent, which is like a, an insert that you can use in informed consents for uh, qualitative research to cover this bit. Um, after that, the qualitative data is in the public domain. And therefore, it has the same status as quantitative data, 
that is not uh, personal data, namely it can't be owned by anybody. So you can freely share it without well, having to ask anybody. Um, there's one exception to this, and that's the so-called database right. The database right is something that was created for companies to um, make it not useless <laughs> to collect certain databases of data. So if you are a company and you have a brilliant idea, you want to collect information about the position of all the trees in the world and then sell this to organizations. I assume there are organizations super interested in exactly where the trees are in the world, municipalities or other governments or other organizations. Uh, of course, the position of all the trees in the world are facts. These can't be owned. Database right holds that if you made some effort to create a certain configuration of facts in a database, then you can claim IP, you can claim ownership of that specific configuration, of that specific database. Not of the facts in it individually, but of that specific configuration. And that then protects such companies if they want to collect such data. Of course, this is, uh, this is exactly orthogonal, exactly opposite to what you want to do in open science. So if you would ever, as an open scientist, and now that open science has been adopted by UNESCO and the EU, and so as a scientist, if as a scientist you'd ever want to use the database right, that would be a bit questionable. Um, but in theory, it is possible. Um, so basically, you can't really place any licenses on data, but because of this existence of database right, and because data might also contain creative works, there are three licenses that you can consider if you want to uh, publish data. The open uh, database license, which is basically CC by SA for data. So basically people can use it, people can share the data, but if they use it and release it again, they also have to place a similar share alike license on it. Or the attribution license, then people just have to tell you that when they share it, tell people that you collected it. Or complete public domain uh, deposition which you can also make explicit. It's always better, you know, once you learn about licenses, you realize that very often the license that rests upon something is kind of clear. For example, if you write a book and you don't license it, it's copyrighted, because that's just how the law is. But it's usually a good idea to actually make this explicit. And that's also the case for, for example, anonymous data. It's best to just say, I hereby place this in the public domain, because then everybody knows exactly where they are. You don't have to wonder, huh, is this really in the public domain or not? Okay, so that's basically a kind of bit of background to get everybody on the same page. There were also a lot of questions that were um, pre-submitted. So I'll go by, go by those now, and then there will be some room for more questions that you may be thought of during the presentation. So the first question, or at least the one that was at the top of the spreadsheet that Titsche sent me. Um, so does a researcher always have the rights to the data they collect, or do institutions have the rights to the data? And in that case, who has the right to choose the license when sharing data? So this is quite clear now. So there are only, well, three types. You could say three types of data, if I, if I broaden it a bit. One, personal data that's never owned by your organization. It's also never owned by you. It's only owned by the person from whom you collected it. And you are only temporarily processing it. So that's solved. Then you have uh, creative works. So if your participants if you do a photo diary study, for example, and participants send you photographs, then those photographs are creative works, which are, again, their property. They own copyright for those photos, which you can arrange with your informed consent. You can solve this, but they are the owners in principle. And then finally, uh, facts, anonymized data, they, they exist in the public domain and they cannot be owned. Unless an organization wants to invoke this database law, but that would be completely inconsistent with open science principles. And as far as I know, pretty much every university at least says that they have an open science policy. And therefore, it would be quite unethical to uh, invoke database law. So basically, institutions don't own data. Only persons can own data. Um, yeah, period. Unless they uh, invoke the database law. Um, one thing that is, seems relevant to mention here depending on the kind of labor contract you're under. Um, it can be the case that if you produce a questionnaire, for example, that is actually the intellectual property of the organization. So the creative works you create during your work hours, when you're actually paid to create it by your organization, you as a person are not actually the owner of that creative work. Generally, the organization will want to make it public under a permissive license, 
because all organizations, at least formally, are in favor of open science. And I assume that if you as a researcher do your due diligence and you have a certain idea about which license works best, the organization will generally follow it. But in theory, they could uh, disagree. I've never heard of anything like that, but I guess in theory. Okay, then second question. Oh, by the way, if the, the question asker is among us and my answer to any of the pre-submitted questions is not clear, or actually if it's not clear to a non-question asker, then feel free to uh, butt in. So the second question, uh, the process uh, when adding tables and figures from research materials. So there are two answers. The first is that these will generally um, be copyrighted to either the researchers or the publisher, depending on how, how the article is licensed. Uh, related to this, a tip for everybody here. If you have any figures, first place them on Zotero or Wikimedia so that you place them online under a given license and then just use those versions in your article because then you are the license owner. You can put it online under a permissive license and then just use it in your article. And then they can never claim copyright. The publisher or anybody else can never claim the copyright because you already own it because you're just reusing an existing image that you just happen to put on the internet, but still it's an existing image. Um, assuming that these are in, uh, owned by the publisher, for example, in one of those older journals where you have to sign over your copyright if you publish there, um, then it depends on whether this falls under fair use or under agreements that your organization made with publishers. And that becomes very different per country and per organization. So this is something you'd have to check probably with your university library. They might be quite uh, aware of the arrangements that you have, especially when it comes to teaching. Then question three is a bit more um, complicated and might also be a good point for discussion. It's not entirely about licensing, but it is a relevant uh, consideration. So commenting on the valid or not so valid concerns re regarding adopting open source might be some one that's good to keep until last if we um, if we don't have enough other questions to fill the time. Then pre-submitted question four, whether sharing open source software can seen uh, as freely sharing an embodiment of something patented, pat patented, however you pronounce it, something that has a patent on it, uh, and therefore be a legal concern and whether there are different consequences depending on the open source license applied. So if software is open source, the term open source is generally meant, not always, so, but generally meant to mean that something has an, an open license that allows you to share it under a certain number of conditions. So if, so basically the first point is check the license. Um, it depends on the specific open source license that you have. But if something is licensed under uh, LGP, for example, or most other common open source licenses, that means it can never be a problem if you share it because the license was created exactly to make very clear to everybody that it is it can be shared freely and adjusted and edited and published again. Also, I think it will be very uncommon that people place a patent, request a patent, patent something, uh, and then place an open source license on it. It might even be impossible legally to simultaneously request a patent and free it up for sharing using an open source license. But I don't know enough about this to really have an answer, I'm afraid. Fortunately, in research, generally we don't patent stuff, at least since we, open science, we are in favor of open science, because again, patents are meant to restrict use of stuff, not to enable people to use it. Well. Please submit it question five. Um, whether certain licenses have either held up or been challenged in court, um, and whether some have just not been challenged in court yet, which means we're not sure about their legal status. So the Creative Commons licenses and the open source licenses have been around for a long time, but I don't know enough whether they have been challenged and whether it held up. But their whole, the whole point of the Creative Commons Foundation is to make sure that they do work, and they have different versions. We're currently up to version four. So I would be surprised if they don't hold up in most courts around the world, but this this is something we'd have to ask a legal scholar, somebody who's really specialized in this kind of stuff. Um, regardless, one of the main functions of licensing, if you do open science stuff, is to uh, communicate to people what they're allowed to do, to give them the comfort to know that they are safely allowed to copy it and stuff. So the idea is generally not that you are the person who wants people to pay money. 
you are the person who wants to make sure that people feel free to use your stuff. So that, in most scenarios, this question won't be too uh, relevant because you, you're not going to sue anybody. You just want them to use your questionnaires or whatever. Then somebody wasn't entirely clear yet about the licenses offered by academic journals. Hopefully that's clear now. Um, if not, you can rewind and watch the first bit again or uh, ask questions about the stuff that's not clear. Then um, question seven, somebody has software that should be publicly available for use in adaptation, but or that should be, so they want to make it publicly available, but are not sure which license to choose. And the CC licenses are not sufficient, but they also don't understand the GNU licenses, the licenses that are generally used for open source software. And they don't want it to be available for commercial use. So in that case, I would use uh, the GPL license, GPL v3, because that's just, well, that's actually, that's just what most people recommend to use, which is also why I recommend it. If you really want to make sure you get exactly the right one, you would have to learn about the GNU license. And if you don't care too much, but you just want to be safe and you want to make sure it doesn't get used for commercial purposes, then the GPL uh, license works. Then question eight. So you're looking for a translated instrument and the authors give it to you. Is that enough permission to use it in your study? Or do you need permission from the original users as well? And if you have permission to use an instrument and then adapt it to a specific population or language, can you then share your adaptation translation with other researchers? So this is a bit more complicated because it again depends on the license under which the original questionnaire was published. Um, if, so yeah, so there's no simple answer because it depends on that license, which is an unknown parameter in this case. Um, my advice would be to try to contact the original authors and try to get them to explicitly license the original questionnaire under a permissive license. For example, they could put it, put it in a public domain or license it under CC BY because that makes the world better in general. So it solves your problem, but also for everybody else. And you might teach them something about licenses. So I think generally in this case, it's good to, get a, to try to uh, talk to them and see whether they're willing to put it in OSF under a permissive license and then everybody can reuse it. If they don't want to put it online under a permissive license, then probably they'll also not want you to publish it again. But then you can just discuss with them under which terms you would be able to, or develop a new instrument that's, that is open and that can freely be used by researchers and therefore is compatible with doing open science. Then question nine, somebody was always wondering which license to use for PAPs at OSF. I've been thinking about this a while, but I must admit, I don't really know what a PAP is. So if somebody does, it would be great if you could tell me. Maybe the question asker is here. Otherwise, we'll move right along. No, nobody knows what a PAP is. Now I'm even more curious, of course, because I would expect at least somebody to know what they are. Okay. And then finally, if an article is not published open access, to what extent can you summarize it and share the results. So this is a bit uh, tricky, I think. So basically the stuff that you report in a paper are facts. So if I do a survey and I have 500 participants and there's a certain correlation, then those are all facts. They can't be owned by anybody. So you're allowed to share them. Um, the way it's written up, so the narrative, the, the discourse, the, 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 the manuscript text, that's a creative work that's owned by the authors or if they signed it over to the publisher, to the publisher. But the, the facts can just be described in any other way. So there's a balance there basically. So don't stay too close to original text. Don't also just because it takes a lot of time, try to rewrite the entire manuscript with the same content, but summarizing it and sharing is completely fine. You're not allowed to reuse images, of course, unless that's legal in your country under, for example, fair use policies fair use uh, boils down to you being allowed to use copyrighted material for fair use under certain conditions because it is sensible that you might want to use it. So it's possible that in your country you are always allowed to use one picture or up to four sentences from any book uh, without any problem. But that depends, uh, depends more on the country. If it's for a teaching purpose, um, you might be able to, you might already be allowed to use specific parts, as I explained a bit earlier, because generally universities uh, make deals with publishers to say, oh, we use some articles and book chapters for teaching and we don't want to negotiate the terms every time. Can we just get a certain agreement that we are allowed to use up to 30 pages from any source? And then we can use that from 
up to 100 sources, and then there's one lump sum paid for this. So for teaching purposes, it can you you may be allowed to do a bit more, and otherwise you're always allowed to reuse all the facts, all the everything that's reported in it, just not in the author's words. Okay, so these were the pre-submitted questions. Does anybody have any non-pre-submitted questions? <laughs> 